Attention on deck. Major Warts and all here. Reporting from the parlor of my fortress out at the farm. Well, it's been an interesting few weeks, and I've decided as much as I didn't want to do it, I will attempt to make a wrap up of what's been on my mind for the last few weeks. So let's get right to it. This, of course, is the usual disclaimer. I am not certified in any medical or psychological practice. To begin, let's take a look at the United States as it was back in December of 2019. This is not a map of the United States and the spread of the COVID-19 virus. It is rather a depiction of our usual flu activity in the fall. In an article written in Healthline magazine by Julia Rees in December of 2019, she reported that between the months of October 1st and December 7th, 2019, there were up to 3. Point million cases of the flu and between 23,000 and 41,000 hospitalizations, with approximately 1,300 to 3,300 flu-related deaths, all according to the CDC. Why the disparity, for example, between 23,000 and 41,000? The reason stood at that time and is as accurate today. Not everybody who has the flu or has flu type symptoms goes into the hospital or to a clinic and is treated and therefore counted. With the COVID-19 scare, everyone, regardless of age group that believes they may have the COVID-19 virus, they've been going to the clinics or to a hospital or to a testing station. And some have been randomly selected for testing by different organizations, colleges, and universities. And consequently, where the number back in the flu season could fluctuate the number now appears to be more inflated. When did the COVID-19 first come to the shores of the United States? Well, the WHO country office reported there is a virus here in China on the 31st of December, 2019. Here in the United States, the virus was first detected in about February 20. Now, by mid-March, all 50 states, including the District of Columbia, New York City, and four U.S. territories had reported the COVID-19 virus in their location. Now this is a comparison chart and I'm not showing you this so you can read the small print. What I would like you to do though is compare side by side the graphic. Notice the flu season starts generally around September, October. It plateaus near the end of the year flattens out, runs for about three months, and then drops off precipitously. This has happened over and over again. 
Now, this also reflects Virginia cases of pneumonia and influenza here in the Commonwealth of Virginia and depicts deaths. Now, look at that drop off. It's like the lights went off and everybody with pneumonia or influenza left the planet. Right around the 13th week of 2020. Something happened. Now I'm going to try to explain what that might be. Here is a depiction of the Virginia COVID cases in 2020. Remember, first reported in the United States back around the end of February, first part of March. And as you can see, the numbers continue to go up. And as they go up, they reach a semblance of a plateau right around mid-April. Then all of a sudden, the numbers jump up precipitously until by mid-May, the numbers have dropped. Once again, in the flu season, we saw this off the end of the chart drop to nothing. And here in Virginia, the COVID-19 cases jumped up right around the same time of that big drop off. Let's take a broader look at all the cases in the United States of COVID-19 from January 12th, the first indicator, until the mid part of April. Notice you've got that increase right around the beginning of March and it continues to climb until just about the first, far, first part of April. And then it once again drops off by mid-April. Heck, by mid-April, most states were just getting on board with locking everything down. Now, that to me is a day late and a dollar short. And we are short, you and I, many dollars right now. So what's really going on? Why those big changes? Why that drop off in influenza reporting? Why the flattening and then all of a sudden the increase in COVID cases again? Well, could it be that based on a CDC March 24 agency advisory, COVID-19 should be reported on the death certificate for all decedents where the disease caused or highlighted here is assumed to have caused or contributed to death. In other words, if someone were to die of pneumonia, which according to the chart doesn't exist anymore after a certain date, or related causes such as cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, cardiac arrest, any of those count it as COVID-19. I don't know. There was a really good YouTube video that came up in April. It got 5 million views and it was almost immediately taken down. Why? because a decision was made by the powerful in the technical world 
made by Facebook, made by YouTube, made by Twitter, who all indicated that if what you were posting was not the party line, you would be censored and the article, item, video taken down. I don't know about you folks, but I live in the United States of America. When you tell me I can't post something that just states medical facts, research that I've done through different scientific journals, and you tell me because it doesn't go along with the party line, it's going to be taken down. That doesn't sound like the United States of America, I and so many others, over these 240 plus years fought to provide liberty. Now, on that article, which has been taken down, here are the key four points. Number one, if you're sick, quarantine for a minimum of 14 days. In some cases, 0 0.0100, there's a chance you're going to die, unless you're in that over 65 category that happens to have underlying medical issues such as cardiac, diabetes, Alzheimer's, other ones like that. Second, a strong immune system needs contact with whatever germs there are out there. The term they like to use now is herd immunity. That means that if you're out and about and you're healthy within that age group under 65, over about five or six, the chances of you getting COVID-19 and not surviving it are pretty low. It's in that other age group. And sadly, that older age group are those that are dying in the greatest numbers throughout the United States. And this is where your parents, your grandparents were sent off to live just so in this case, they just might die. Now, I don't know about you, but if I know that nursing homes and convalescent homes are hotbeds for con contracting COVID-19 and not surviving, I probably would isolate people that are already there in order to isolate the rest of the population Instead, what happened in New York? Somebody at the top made a decision that instead of taking the COVID-19 cases they had, where they had them there and in control in the hospitals, in the clinic, and turned them over to either the Javits Center or to the USNS Comfort in order to isolate them from the general population, they sent them back to the homes. Folks, makes no sense to me. Number three, being in your house is not out in the fresh air. Being in your house is not out in the sunshine where good old vitamin D is kicking around 
and being absorbed by your body, which really helps your immune system. Does it make any sense that you are locked down in your house and not afforded an opportunity of developing a stronger immunity so that when it leaves or when it comes back, your system will be able to identify it and fight it off. So consequently, bottom line, if you have no outward symptoms or current comorbidity, get out about your life. Get out there and do stuff. But there's always unintended consequences. And here are the key consequences of the lockdown and total social distancing. No going to the park, no getting a haircut, no stopping off for a little lunch or a small supper. Stay in your home. Now, I'm going to sound facetious here, but I live out here at the farm. It's my dog raider and my two cats. That's it. I drive myself crazy, but could you imagine if I'm a normal family of, let's say four, where hubby gets up early or the other spouse gets up early, they go off to work. The kids go off to school. Rest, relaxation, or busting my butt at the house is what takes place then. We are all back in our normal routine. Kids come home, routine changes, dinner's being ready for the table, hubby, spouse comes home, have a nice dinner, and then nag at each other for a while. How are you doing at school? What's going on with your horse? Hey, what's that black eye? Oh, why did you hit your brother? And until bedtime, there's a little tension there with everybody. But when you're stuck in the house, isolated from everybody and everything else, bad things can happen. And here are six of the keys. Number one, child molestation. I don't really understand why people go out looking for who are the molesters when time and again studies show that most abuse of children happen by a close relative. Second, if you can't walk away from an argument with your spouse in the morning, it festers during the day. And while it's festering, it almost always gets worse, causing either verbal or physical or mental spousal abuse. Now, I've talked about this a little bit before, but alcoholism is on the rise. In my case, it's not. That's because when I went over on my ketogenic lifestyle change the first of the year, I cut out almost all alcohol, with the exception of two glasses of wine with supper in the evening. Uh, other than that, no rum and cokes in the afternoon. No single malt whiskeys later in the day. No cooking with wine. No having breakfast with a big, giant Bloody Mary. Nope. Alcoholism for me is pretty much 
no longer an issue. But were I in a home where I had family around me, where I couldn't get out and about, there is a chance, and it's being shown right now, that alcoholism, drug abuse, and dementia are all on the rise. Now, I've been working for the last decade with veterans and the suicide situation. Well, the good news is the VA is doing a lot to work with us veterans, especially when either we've identified we have a problem or someone else identifies we have a problem. I might not be able to go down to the VA medical center, but I can get right online and do a face-to-face -face with the mental health professionals or with my primary care physician right from my wonderful parlor. Sadly, where there may be a downtick in suicides among veterans, there is a marked uptick in suicide among the general population especially those that don't have a view that their life is going to be okay. They might be losing their house. They might have lost their car. They might have lost their job. And they have nothing to look forward to. And in some cases, sadly, Individuals who love their family dearly but can't talk to them or anyone else about the mental issues they have rather than see everything go down the tubes for their family. They've got only one other way out. That's very sad. Fifth point, if you're not out and about, if you're not out there getting exposed at whatever level it would normally happen for you, your immune system is not going to grow and fortify itself so that when this thing comes back, and it will come back, that you are likely going to survive regardless of the age that you are. I turned 75 on May 21st. Well, I expect to live a lot longer, a lot happier, and do my best to be fulfilled because I am not going to become homeless. I am going to have a plan in place where I can guarantee that my lifestyle, and hopefully by helping others around me, their lifestyle will continue once we get beyond this COVID-19 pandemic. Just thought I'd leave uh, with a couple more numbers for you. To kind of decide for yourself, is COVID-19 nothing more than a stronger, a stronger case of the flu. Taking our numbers from that earlier article by Ms. Reese, they estimated that October 1st to the 27th or to the 7th of December, there were 3.7 million cases of pneumonia and flu in the United States with between 23,000 and 41,000 hospitalizations and the number of deaths upward of 33. Looking on the other side, looking at COVID from March to May, 1.46 million cases 342,000 hospitalizations and 87,000 deaths. 
that last figure is, in my mind, a major question. Is this really COVID or is it a combination of other morbidities that have just been documented as being COVID-19? When this all started, the initial concerns were that it was highly contagious, rapidly spreading, a fear of overburdening the health system, millions of deaths, a mandated lockdown that will lead ultimately to a new normal. That's what we were told reality would be. The current reality though is it's fatal generally to the oldest population with pre-existing conditions or at any age if you have a weak immune system. Hospitals were not overburdened. In fact, hospitals now are closing down because they can't bring people in for normal checks. Mammograms, skin cancer, diabetes screening, Alzheimer's, cardiac conditions. So if the hospitals are adjusting well, it's adjusting as it reflects on COVID-19, but not on general health of the population. And where we were told that deaths would be in the millions. The deaths, and trust me, I fully understand that one death is a bad death for someone other than the person that's left this mortal plane. I understand that. Now, all that said, all the bad news, Here's some good news. Most states should be open by Memorial Day, at least at some level. There still are some federal agencies that want to hold out for some kind of a vaccine. It could happen by the end of the year. It might not happen for two years. Some states want to stay closed down when it comes to small businesses that they don't consider essential. Some states are actually giving their counties and cities enough latitude to make their own decisions. And some of these decisions make sense. Whereas others, I really, I really question when the reality stick is gonna smack some of these people in the forehead. But come on Memorial Day. I'm all about flags. I'm all about the country. I'm all about veterans. Well, I know this has been an awful lot. I hope that I've piqued your interest once again and haven't overburdened you with too many facts and figures, but that's what I do. As I indicated, I will always attempt to give you the best analysis of whatever the topic is, with the exception of politics. I'm not going there. So if you haven't already subscribed and you found this interesting, hit that subscribe button and smack that bell so that you'll know when I 
Have another think piece. And lastly, give the old guy a thumbs up. This is Major Warts and all. Out.